In this news roundup of the week for 12th of August 2022. Unfolding drama as story circulates that nuclear secrets were the focus for the FBI raid on Trump. A new report says that war between China and the US over Taiwan would inflict huge losses on US forces. And massive lawsuits to hit the failed Tavistock transgender clinic for pushing puberty blockers onto kids. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Fallout continues from the momentous FBI raid on Trump's home in Mar-a-Lago, with Attorney General Merrick Garland saying that he personally approved the move and that a motion had been filed to make the search warrant public. The Washington Post made the claim that the search had been in response to the high security classified documents, including some relating to nuclear weapons, as well as some intercepted communications of foreign leaders, quoting sources close to the investigation. Separately, Fox News suggested that an insider at Mar-a-Lago had provided the FBI with a tip-off about the nature of some of the documents that were there and where they were specifically located. This has led to the inevitable divergence of narratives. For one side has it that this extraordinary measure, and it is unprecedented, raiding the hood of a former president, is justified because of genuine national security concerns. Trump is known to have had foreign dignitaries visiting his home there, it would be easy for damaging secrets to fall into the wrong hands. And Democrats were taking to the airwaves with the message that the American way is that no man, whoever they may be, is above the law. The other narrative is that this is a full-on renewal of the Trump witch hunt, with the FBI carrying out patently political actions designed to try and keep Trump off the ballot. Republican Senator Josh Hawley said Biden had taken our republic into dangerous waters and said, at a minimum, Garland must resign or be impeached. The search warrant must be published, Christopher Wray must be removed, and the FBI reformed top to bottom. Senator Lindsey Graham noted that Trump was likely to stand in 2024, midterm elections less than 100 days away. Launching such an investigation of a former president this close to an election is beyond problematic. Some of the immediate backlash has focused on the FBI, as well as the judge who granted the warrant, with the usual reports of abuse and death threats and the like. On Gab, where the more excitable Trump supporters hang out, reportedly users have been talking about preparing for armed revolution, which generally you can dismiss as just talk, although everyone is made a little jumpier than usual by the fact that on Thursday an armed man, Ricky Schiffer, tried to breach the FBI's Cincinnati office and was shot and killed by police after he fled the scene. An account in his name on Trump's true social platform called for supporters to be ready for combat. They have been conditioning us to accept tyranny and think we can't do anything for two years. This time we must respond with force. According to the UK's Daily Telegraph, senior figures in the GOP, while publicly gathered in Trump's defence, are said to be bracing themselves because if the seriousness of a breach turns out to be accurate, it could be more damaging to Trump and the party than so far acknowledged. Not helped by the fact that it was a 2018 law signed by Trump himself that made the retention of classified documents a felony carrying a potential jail term of up to five years. Ironically, Trump may additionally have shot himself in the foot by publicising the raid in order to promote it as another round of persecution against him. Search warrants are kept under seal to protect the reputation of the people they apply to, but because Trump himself broke the news, he thereby removed expectations of privacy. That made it possible for Garland to request the release of the warrant, and now if Trump contests it, that would look odd. None of which will matter at all to his base who will presume deep state machinations, regardless of what comes out over the next couple of days, which all feels dramatic, but at least is still quite a long way from actual civil war. No bombs flying around just yet. And on that theme, the Chinese military drills, right next to Taiwan, they finally came to an end this week as the dust settled behind Nancy Pelosi's visit there with some people speculating on whether China might be prompted to make an early move on invading the island, there was a sobering report 
by the Center for Strategic and International Studies that said that war between the US and China over Taiwan, even assuming it did not go nuclear, would nevertheless result in large-scale losses for the US forces. It said that the battle could see US and Japanese navies sinking up to 150 Chinese vessels and Taiwan could potentially be successfully defended, but the cost would be huge, with a large proportion of the US fleet sunk and as many as 900 American warplanes destroyed within the first four weeks alone. The pessimistic assessment comes because it would be impossible to take down Chinese defences before engaging in close action. Mark Kanchian for CSIS said that in the wake of such a conflict, it would take years for the US to rebuild its forces because of low production rates. Other nations such as Russia and Iran might take advantage of US weakness. Better emphasise instead all that collaborative work with China, you know, on issues like climate change. And speaking of that, we got a fascinating couple of insights into the shifting sands on China's action on energy infrastructure. First, we learned that China now has the second largest number of nuclear power plants in operation or under construction in the world. According to an official with the National Nuclear Safety Administration, Tang Bo, China had 54 nuclear power units in operation in June this year, with a further 23 under construction. It's also given the go-ahead for the building of an experimental fourth-generation nuclear molten salt reactor, which could become the forerunner for safer and cleaner nuclear power in the future. This is one key component in the country delivering on its promised peaking of carbon emissions before 2030. But another component is getting something of a rethink. According to Bloomberg, this time China is having second thoughts about its headlong rush to expand solar and wind power. The current climate-related events in the country, floods, droughts and food supply issues, may well underline the importance of getting to reduced emissions, but it's also presenting authorities with a reality check about how much precious farmland the nation can afford to lose. Remember, China has one of the lowest proportions of productive farmland per head of population in the world. Solar and wind farms have been pushed hard over the last two years since Xi Jinping announced the net zero for 2060 target. But with the lurching straight to scale, which is often the feature of these big Chinese government plans, it's becoming obvious that this may not be the way to go. Because, as we've observed many times, covering what would be productive land with solar panels is not very energy dense. In other words, it uses a lot of land for a modest amount of energy. It's intriguing that it might be China that is the first to observe in practice what some of us have held to be reasonably obvious in theory. It makes sense to value energy sources that are highly dense. Keep your land free for more productive purposes. In any case, according to the report, big new solar projects are now coming under rather more intense scrutiny than they were previously. Now, if that arm of the Chinese energy octopus gets taken out, the question will be raised, how else is it going to meet its target? The Chinese source of pride is that while America and the West demand bigger and bigger targets, but then fails completely to meet them, China promises only what it believes is in its interest, and then it prioritises turning that into reality. I mean, take that with a pinch of salt. Autocratic regimes have layers of middle management incentivised to massage the figures to make themselves look good. Nevertheless, they have now to find alternative routes to making that 2060 figure, and that's going to be fascinating to watch. Nevertheless, it is instructive that a player that jumped with major commitment into solar and wind power is now quickly retreating. You would think that maybe those in the new UK government arguing for a new conservative view of net zero, they might well be inclined to take inspiration from such news should they get to hear about it. Likely influential player in that next government, Lord Frost, wrote a policy paper this week that amongst a wide-ranging agenda for the country included a more sceptical view of the current approaches to net zero. 
which you could summarise as he was arguing for more nuclear and similarly dense energy sources, more local production of fossil fuels needed in the short term, for instance via fracking, more scepticism to what he termed medieval technology, by which he meant wind turbines. Now that won't be the final word. New nuclear is expensive up front. Offshore wind has expanded so much recently because it has achieved, via a period of public subsidy for sure, a positive price differential. But more scrutiny and harder questions may well see a slightly different target mix coming out of government in the next few months after they get over the shock of all the short-term demands for support with spiralling energy bills, a subject we will come back to later. But before that, one car crash of UK policy that is at least in the process of being cleaned up Last week, we discussed the fact that the Tavistock Gender Clinic is to be shut down following the highly critical report into its controversial affirmative approach to children identifying as transgender. It should be a surprise to absolutely nobody that the next event is that it is now facing a massive legal action by up to a thousand families and their youngsters claiming that they were rushed into taking life-changing puberty blocker drugs and other treatment. In what universe was that not going to happen? So the medical negligence lawsuit, according to the Times of London, will allege that vulnerable children were misdiagnosed and placed on a damaging medical pathway. This includes being recklessly prescribed puberty blockers, which have potentially harmful side effects, having adopted an unquestioning, affirmative approach to children who said that they were transgender. The Tavistock had treated 19,000 children with described symptoms of gender dysphoria since 1989. In her devastatingly critical report, Dr Hilary Cass found that the clinic overlooked other mental health issues in the children and failed to collect data on the side effects of puberty blockers. It's hard to ignore that the practices Cass described at the Tavistock had largely apparently been adopted from emerging current practice in the United States. So whether this is the start of a process that will ripple back to where it started or not remains to be seen. Not quickly, for sure. The Biden administration is strongly promoting transgender medicines and puberty blockers are widely currently being used. The US mainstream media has been remarkably quiet about the downfall of the Tavistock in the UK and the reasons for it. One low-key piece in the New York Times which said it was all down to long wait times, insufficient mental health support and the surging number of young people seeking gender treatments. Well, not exactly, no. However, the moment seems to have been the catalyst for Conservative ministers in the current interim UK government to begin to take other actions. So the former leadership candidate and current Attorney General, Suella Braverman, said that schools that teach young children about changing their gender identity could have their Ofsted rating downgraded. Now, Ofsted ratings are used to show whether a school is rated excellent or good or indeed poor, and they are highly coveted by the schools themselves for obvious reasons. They go to great lengths to get good Ofsted reports. She highlighted that some schools were pushing the idea that you could change your gender to children as young as four years old, and said that schools would be getting explicit guidance to steer them away from such practice. In a speech to the right-wing think tank Policy Exchange, she said this, In my view, a primary school where they are teaching eight or nine-year-old pupils, key words such as transgender, pansexual, asexual, gender expression, intersex, gender fluid, gender dysphoria and question your queer would be falling foul of government guidance. With echoes of that NHS ruling, She said schools ran the danger of breaching their duty of impartiality and indoctrinating children into a one-sided and controversial view of gender. She also said that institutions have the right to exclude transgender people from single-sex spaces, such as toilets, changing rooms or women's refuges. 
in case you're thinking, well, wait, that's all very well, but there's this leadership contest going on and surely the new prime minister could just come straight in and reverse all of that. Well, maybe. But both candidates have said that they would, for instance, ban the NHS from prescribing puberty blockers. So it doesn't seem likely that a major change of emphasis is on the way. The likely winner on current polling, Liz Truss, has also gone on record as saying she would not use lockdowns as a health measure in the future. That may be influenced by the steady drip feed of news about what the real costs of those lockdowns have been, which I've been referring to on this channel when they've come in. So this week we learned that there was a backlog of 10,000 cancer patients awaiting treatment thanks largely to lockdowns. Those are just the currently known cases. According to the Daily Telegraph, oncologists have said that tens of thousands may end up dying needlessly because they're not being seen quickly enough, based on the pre-pandemic throughput figures. Oncologist Pat Price from Imperial College London said that the current situation was, quote, the worst cancer crisis of my lifetime. This comes at a time when we are seeing significantly higher non-COVID excess mortality, which again we've talked about on the channel recently before. According to the Office for National Statistics, mortality is 18% above the five-year average, amounting to 1,895 excess deaths. Well, in the middle of summer, well outside the season for flu and other respiratory illnesses, that is a striking anomaly. It's a phenomenon intuitively likely to be made up of all of those whose treatment was the casualty of the focus single-mindedly on COVID. But so far, no methodical research has begun to unpick the various causal factors. It's also playing out, we found out this week, in huge waiting times for accident and emergency patients. According to the Times of London, today, nearly a thousand patients every day are having to wait 12 hours or more in A&E departments. And that's assuming you get there alive in the first place. Because sadly, that's not happening for everybody. Ambulance response times for life-threatening emergencies were the joint worst on record last month. People with a suspected stroke or a heart attack waited on average 59 minutes for an ambulance. The target is supposed to be 18 minutes. In spite of all of that, the NHS has not featured massively as an issue in the Conservative leadership race. So as of yet, we have relatively few clues what the new Prime Minister's approach to the National Health Service situation is going to be. Hopefully, it will be driven by a careful look at the facts and not the panic mongers. Speaking of which, if you can keep your head while all about are losing theirs. Well, there's a lot of people losing their heads right now and they are indeed inviting you to join them. It's worth just standing back, looking at how the process works, because in a few months time, it'll be another issue. And then a few months after that, another issue. But the process of how you're invited to panic is going to be broadly the same. Now, it doesn't mean that those issues won't be serious, that they won't need some action. But I can guarantee right now, even not knowing what they are exactly, they won't be made better by people panicking. So today it's energy prices. Energy prices have shot up. It is really a problem. Some people in the country are struggling right now and need real help, and we know that's going to get worse before it gets better. But the panic comes with all the mainstream media stories and all the demands for immediate action. Stories like energy bills to top £5,000 next year in new shock to household. This is the latest of a string of stories, identical, save for the number which goes up every time. And you get a number of journalists then demanding of the candidates for prime minister. How much support will you give these people in the face of those figures? How can it ever be enough? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And others are saying this is too urgent. It cannot even wait for the election of a new prime minister. We need urgent action now, now, now. When you get confronted with all of that, it's easy to get carried along with it. Whereas you should step back, take a breath. Maybe that news story will turn out to be right. But let's note, first of all, that like many of these stories, it's a projection, a prediction. 
Never forget that journalists gravitate towards worst case scenarios. Doesn't mean they couldn't happen, but you shouldn't swallow the hype and the hysteria that suggests that it's as good as already has. Whether prices actually go up depends on a, a range of factors. Starting with the progress of the war in Ukraine, it depends on Russia's chess playing with gas provision to Europe, it depends on the state of the global economy, on China's rate of consumption of gas, initiatives that governments take to reduce the pressure on themselves. Lots of variables. We know that things will get a bit worse in the short term. The nature of energy contracts and LNG shipments has that baked in. But beyond that, we do not know. The market is presuming a full cut-off of Russian gas to Europe. That may not be what happens. Indeed, the war might be over by winter, given recent intelligence about the possible forthcoming collapse of Russian forces. Maybe. Numerous countries at the moment are trying to fill winter gas and oil storage to capacity to give themselves a buffer, which is the geopolitical equivalent of panic shopping. Well, that is being achieved and the pressure will begin to ease because of so. Japan is firing up nine nuclear power stations for winter, which will free up four billion cubic metres of supply of gas. So, little by little, people across the world plan, they take action, they adapt, they do what they can to improve their exposure. Also, we do expect some economic slowdown, so energy consumption will fall accordingly, affecting prices. The sum total of all of that is that if a few of those go the right way, even if a few of them go the wrong way, the likelihood of those worst case scenarios goes down. The smart leader in waiting would refuse to be panicked, refuse to be pushed into promising support on the basis of what the journalists say is going to happen long into the future. They should ignore what Ambrose Evans Pritchard described in The Telegraph as a bidding war of extreme proposals, which included things like non-payment campaigns, windfall taxes, state control of energy market prices, forcing companies to run at a loss. All proposals that would have a bucket full of unintended consequences, as things devised in a hurry tend to do. We have an immediate problem. We have reliable information about the short term. Focus in on that to the degree you need to in order to improve your position. We also know that there were mistakes made in the past. Investment in energy was put off when it really, they should have bitten the bullet and made the investments. So there is some long term action to be initiated. The refusal to panic about worst case predictions is because we benefit from cool heads looking at what needs to be done, not because such things can simply be ignored. It's like the people saying that we should be panicking about climate change and treating it like an emergency. Well, no, that actually doesn't help our situation. A clear eyed and fact based assessment of the current challenges. So in the UK, we have a drought right now with the various impacts that will come from that. We know we have to plan for that to happen more often. And at the same time, taking a clear eyed view of the investments we need to make for the future, for things we can afford that will make the most difference, making good decisions, the investments we need to make that will pay dividends back in the future, smart investments and the ability to spot the fashionable demands driven by panic that actually would not achieve the intended goals and therefore should be rejected. It's not a process that gets better with panic. Not a process will be made more effective if it's designed on the worst case scenarios of journalists whose business model, remember, encourages them to create drama at every opportunity. So in my view, that's the mindset that the candidates for leaders should have. For your own sanity, for your own thriving in your life, you could do worse than take that mindset for your own as well. Don't let them make you panic. All right. My thanks as always to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. You know the story. This would not be possible without them. I couldn't conceivably take the time that I do to make two videos per week and all the research that goes into the videos that I make. I couldn't choose whatever topics I find interesting. I would have to be chasing the algorithm, going after therefore one side as opposed to going into what is actually factual, whether or not it's popular. If you would like to join that incredibly important group 
and add your support for the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please head on over to patreon.com forward slash Malin Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.